Here we have one mole of oxygen at a pressure of 6 atmospheres and a temperature of 27 degrees Celsius. If we heat the gas at a constant volume until the pressure triples, what is the final temperature? And if we heat it so that both the volume and the pressure double, what is the final temperature? Well, first things first, 27 degrees Celsius is 300 Kelvin. If you don't do that first, you're gonna get this wrong. Second, realize a bunch of this information doesn't matter. We don't care that it's one mole, and we don't care that it's six atmospheres. All we care about is how things change. So let's apply the universal gas law. P1V1 over T1 equals P2V2 over T2, but the volumes are the same, so they cancel. Plug in 3P1 to show that the pressure triples, and solve for T2. You get 900 Kelvin, which is 627 degrees Celsius. Do the same thing for part B, only use 2P1 and 2V1. Cancel the P1V1s, solve, and you get 4 times the temperature, or 1200 Kelvin, that's 927 degrees Celsius. See what I mean how without Kelvin you'd get this completely wrong? Quadrupling 27 gets you 927, if you do it right. Suppose you have a steel ring with a gap cut in it, and you heat it up. What happens to the size of the gap? Well, it turns out that when the ring gets heated, the whole thing expands. And when that happens, it's like enlarging a picture on your phone. Everything gets bigger. And that means that that gap will get bigger as if it were made of steel. You can actually do the math for it just like you would if it were a piece of steel instead. So let's do that next. If that gap is 1.600 centimeters when the temperature is 30 degrees, what is the width when the temperature is 190 degrees? This is a very straightforward question. Thermal expansion says delta L equals alpha L naught delta T. Alpha is the coefficient of thermal expansion, which for steel we can look up and find is 11 times 10 to the minus 6 per degree Celsius. Plug in the rest of your numbers, you get 0.002816 centimeters, so the new length is 1.603 centimeters. That's all there is to it. If a weather balloon is designed to expand to a radius of 20 meters at working altitude, where the air pressure is 0 0.030 atmospheres and the temperature is 200 Kelvin, if it's filled at atmospheric pressure on the ground where it's 300 Kelvin, what is its radius at liftoff? For this problem, all you really need is the universal gas law. P1V1 over T1 equals P2V2 over T2, and then the volume of a sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed. Plug in, cancel, solve, plug in your numbers, and you get 7.11 meters. Done. This problem is review from chemistry. We have an aluminum cup of unknown mass. It contains 225 grams of water, a 40 gram copper stirrer, and they're all at 27 degrees Celsius. We put a 400 gram ingot, that's a chunk, of silver at a temperature of 87 degrees Celsius in the water. The stirrer is then used to stir the mixture until it reaches a final equilibrium temperature of 32 degrees Celsius. Assuming there's no heat loss to the environment, what is the mass of the aluminum cup? Really, this is conservation of energy. We're going to use mc delta t, where m is the mass, c is the specific heat, delta t is the temperature. We'll have to look up all those specific heats. And all we do is say mc delta t for the cup, plus mc delta t for the water, and then for the copper, and then for the silver, has to add up to zero joules. That's the change in energy is zero. Then you just plug in all of your numbers, noticing that on the very last one, the change in temperature is negative. That's why this will add up to zero. Do all that, solve, you get 80 grams. Here we have a cylinder full of a gas with a tight-fitting lid that is free to move. We know the area and we know the mass of the lid, and we know there are three moles inside and it's at 500 Kelvin. We want to know how high up the cylinder would be when it's in equilibrium under its own weight. So for starters, we're going to use a PV equals nRT. Solve that for volume. Now we know volume is area times height. Now for the pressure, we have both atmospheric pressure plus the pressure from the weight of the lid, which is force over area, that's weight, mg, over area. Plug those in and solve for height. Plug in your numbers and you are done you get a very tall 2.47 meters. 
Suppose we have a 250 meter steel bridge that some massively overpaid engineer has decided to make out of two 125 meter sections with no expansion joints. So the first question is, how big does the gap get between those spans if the bridge cools by 20 degrees Celsius? And the second question is, if the temperature goes up and the bridge buckles, how big will that buckle be at 20 degrees Celsius? Part A is just thermal expansion. Delta L equals alpha L naught delta T. Plug in alpha for steel, plug in 125 and 20 degrees, we get 0 0.0275 meters per span. The gap is two spans, so double that to get 0.055 meters or 5.5 centimeters. For the second problem, that same math applies, only now we've made a triangle with a base of 125 and a hypotenuse of 125.0275. If we use the Pythagorean theorem and solve for height, we get 2.6 meters, which should make it really obvious why we use expansion joints in bridges and why this engineer is overpaid. If a 60 kilogram runner expends 300 watts of power while running a marathon, about 90% of that energy is wasted and gets wicked away as sweat. This is what allows humans to run for so long compared to animals that depend on panting. So anyway, how much sweat would that be? Well, 90% of 300 watts is 270 watts, and that energy for an hour is going to be 270 watts times 3600 seconds, 9.72 times 10 to the 5 joules. All of that is going to go into vaporizing this water. And so if Q equals ML, M is Q over L, L is given in the problem. Plug in your numbers, you get 0.403 kilograms, that's per hour, and your average marathoner takes 4 to 5 hours, which is definitely why they need to take some drinks along the way. For this problem, we have a gas engine which is going through a cycle from A to B to C back to A. At A, we have a pressure P0 of 3 atmospheres, a volume V0 of 0.025 cubic meters, that would be 25 liters, and we know there are two moles. Our job is to find the state variables P, V, T, and U, that's pressure, volume, temperature, and internal energy at A, B, and C, as well as to find the transition variables Q, W, and delta U as they pass between states A to B, B to C, and C to A. And yeah, for this kind of problem, charts come in really handy. We can fill in our pressure and volume just by looking at the graph. To find the temperature at point A, we can use the ideal gas law, PV equals nRT. Solve for T and plug in the numbers we're given. We get 451 Kelvin. To get the internal energy at A, we need to use 3 halves nRT. That's the equation I told you is not on your reference tables and you absolutely need to memorize. You know N, you know R, you know T, plug them in, you get 11,243 joules. You can do that again at state B, or you can use the combined gas law to figure out that it's quadrupled the temperature, or 1804 Kelvin. Use 3 halves NRT again, you get quadruple the internal energy, 44,974 joules. Do the exact same thing for C, and you'll get 902 Kelvin and 22,487 joules. There you go, that's all of our state variables. So let's move on to the transition variables. To find these, we're going to use the first law of thermodynamics, delta U equals Q plus W. To find work, we're going to use the area under the curve. To find delta U, we can simply subtract because we know U, the internal energy at each point. And to find Q, well, once we have delta U and W, the first law of thermodynamics makes finding Q very easy. So here we go. Delta U is just literally the difference in the U values you've already calculated. Done. Work is the area under the graph, keeping in mind that it is negative if the gas is expanding and positive if the gas is contracting. We get 22,500 joules for A to B, zero joules under this vertical line from B to C, and from C to A, well that's three quarters of the area from A to B, so we get three quarters of the number, this time positive because the gas is contracting. From there, we just plug W and delta U into delta U equals Q plus W to get our values for Q. We add a lot of heat from A to B, and then we exhaust a lot of heat from B to C and C to A. 
If we want to know the efficiency of this engine, we can take the total work done, that's A to B plus C to A, and then divide by the total amount of heat that we added to the system, that's from A to B. We get a whopping 10% efficiency. Comparatively, a perfect Carnot engine operating from our high and low temperatures is, well, the efficiency is the percent difference between those high and low temperatures, which is 75%. This engine is pretty inefficient.